Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for what's actually the last in our kind of season for um, our With Insight talks. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Jane Wilkinson, the Executive Director here at the COG. And what we're going to be doing tonight is um, talking about our very unique approach to cancer research. And in this case, um, a real focus on early detection and, that, and we all, how we all understand that early detection is truly essential for improving the treatment and also the outcome of the treatment when it comes to cancer. Um, we take a very convergent approach to research and tonight we're, our convergence is actually going to be between um, a clinical perspective that Lisa is going to give us and then combining the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So a real demonstration of our convergent approach to research. So we've got two teams of investigators this evening, Ava and Jesse, and they're from the Bartia lab here at the Coke. And they're gonna be talking about a non-invasive early detection and disease monitoring um, project that they're working on. But we're actually gonna start the evening with um, Regina and Leisha. Um, Leisha is a clinical oncologist and is bringing us our clinical perspective here. And they're gonna talk about how they've been developing algorithms that are gonna look much, much deeper into the radiological images that um, we produce um, to potentially predict a future risk for lung cancer. Um, so this is our vision um, for how we are gonna make smarter decisions, especially when we think about um, treatment and patient care. Um, before I hand it over um, to our speakers, I wanna give a special thank you to our supporters. Um, they're really the ones who are making this research um, into lung cancer and other research that we're doing in lung cancer truly possible. Um, so these projects have been funded by the Frontier Research Program, um, the Bridge Project, and I do wanna um, give a shout out that um, Regina and Leisha were actually the winners of the 2022 um, GEL Team Award as part of the Bridge Project as well. Um, and also a shout out to um, our friends from Upstage Lung Cancer as well. I, we're all here to chat afterwards in the social, so please hang out, um, and especially if you're interested in some of these opportunities that we'll be talking to tonight. So with that, I am going to ask Lisha to come up and talk about the clinical perspective. better now? <laughs> Sorry about that. I basically just said I'm Leisha Sequest. Nice to meet you. So, <laughs> um, so I, I googled women getting cancer treatments and these are some images that came up on Google uh, of women getting cancer treatment and um, you know I don't know these particular women or what their exact story is but I'm wondering what the audience thinks. Maybe they're being treated for the number one cause of cancer death in women, which is... <laughs> Spoiler! <laughs> I was expecting someone to shout out breast cancer, but no, the number one cause of cancer-related death in women is lung cancer. Thank you, Hildy. <laughs> uh, so... Um, 
Yes, here is the latest figures from the American Cancer Society. And this graph is used in a lot of clinical presentations. Uh, it, it's updated every year by the American Cancer Society. And it shows you uh, for women on the right-hand side and men on the left-hand side, how many Americans are dying from each type of cancer per year. And for my entire career, which is now about 20 years, lung cancer has been on the top of both lists, unfortunately. Um, so it is the number one cause of cancer death for men and women around the world and in the U.S. Um, however, we don't hear about it as much. You know, we hear about, especially when we're thinking about cancer screening, we think a lot about breast cancer, we think about colorectal cancer. Um, we don't hear as much about lung cancer screening. Yes, we're going to talk about that. Uh, I think so. Um, Lung cancer has historically been very linked with smoking, uh, but that is changing. And uh, the good news is that smoking-related lung cancers are decreasing, probably for lots of reasons. You know, in Massachusetts, I think it was in around 1998 or so that they outlawed smoking in restaurants and bars, and that's really been almost all the countries, all the states in the country now. So. You know, smoking in public, had, had, you know, used to be allowed on airplanes, no longer. So smoking um, restrictions ha uh, and just general change in public perception of smoking have really decreased the number of Americans that are smoking. And smoking-related lung cancer is going down. But uh, lung cancer that's completely independent from smoking is skyrocketing. Uh, but historically, this is a very tight association in our minds, right, that lung cancer is caused from smoking. So I also, since we're talking this whole session about early detection, I wanted to mention what we mean when we say that. Um, because it seems obvious, but not everyone has the same idea about early detection of cancer. So we think um, that a cancer starts at some point. It's microscopic. It's just one cell that's gone bad in some way. It's gone haywire, divides and becomes two and then four. Ultimately, there's some kind of point in this um, continuum where symptoms come on and clinical diagnosis usually happens after that. So there's some kind of symptom like a cough or a pain that leads you to see a doctor and then that might lead to the diagnosis. Um, and so there's, there's a period where there's cancer there but there's no symptoms or no one knows about it because it hasn't been detected. There's also, these aren't necessarily meant to be exactly superimposable, but there's a second timeline where there's the cancer is curable until at some point it is grown or spread to a point where it's no longer curable. And when we're talking about early detection, we really want to find cancers when they're still curable. And the tricky part about that is that it often lines up with the other timeline of when patients are not having symptoms. So again, it's not that once symptoms start, it's automatically incurable. Every patient is different, but there's a timeline for symptoms and there's a timeline for curability and they're kind of similar-ish. And so in order to find cancer when it's still curable, we have to be screening people, which means testing them for cancer when they feel fine, they have no symptoms. That's the whole principle behind early detection is screening people who feel fine, who aren't complaining of any kind of symptom of cancer, trying to see if they have an early asymptomatic, but hopefully curable cancer. So it's kind of the basic principle of screening. In the US, there's an organization called the United States Preventive Services Task Force. It's a mouthful, but they're the the organization that tells physicians what is the evidence, the medical evidence behind screening. And currently there are four cancers listed on the slide that the USPSTF recommends that we screen people for. And so those are cervical, colon, breast, and lung. And the details of you know, how old the people have to be, what is the screening test are all on the slide. You don't have to pay attention to that necessarily. Um, but there are dozens of types of cancer. It's not like there's only four types of cancer, right? So we're missing pancreas, we're missing ovary, we're missing esophageal, we're missing prostate, we're missing dozens of different types of cancer from this list. How are we doing with these recommendations? 
do doctors and patients follow these recommendations? Well, this is the latest data um, about how many Americans that fit the criteria that I listed on this slide about you know, being a certain age and certain health status, are we being up to date with screening? Uh, here you can see all Americans um, in orange, and then it's also broken down by white and black. Both the breast and cervical data are for females only. The colon is males and females together. So cervical is the best. We're, we're doing a good job of screening, um, keeping women up to date with pap smears for cervical screening. Mammography is not bad. It's, it's quite good. Between 60 and 70% of women are up to date. Um, colon is a little bit less. Lung cancer is not even on this graph because you wouldn't be able to see it, it's so low. I have a second graph for lung cancer. The bottom line is we're doing a very poor job. So this is broken down by state. The US average is that 5% of people who should be getting lung cancer screening are getting it. So if you have to look at the, uh, the Y axis, you see that the maximum up there is only 15%. Um, so Massachusetts is the leader, but we are kind of the king of the losers. So, you know, we're only, <laughs> we're only screening about 14 or 15% of our citizens who should be getting lung cancer screening. So it's nothing to really be proud of. Uh, I could talk to you guys for an hour about the reasons behind this. It's complicated. It has a lot to do with policies that have been put in place and stigma that we all carry subconsciously about smoky, smokers and how lung cancer may be a self-inflicted disease, which I don't believe is true. Um, but uh, that's not our focus of today. But this is a really big problem. And this is a problem that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, so we're doing a very poor job of screening. Right now, in order to access lung cancer screening, you have to be a heavy smoker. We're doing a poor job of screening our citizens who are smokers or have been. Uh, but we're not even screening the people who are getting lung cancer. So I kind of mentioned before that the disease is changing. And this is a, a recent publication that I just did with a colleague, Roya Sergeybon. This is a global perspective, but here the 100% is over on the right. And what we're looking at is if you consider all the patients in these different regions of the world who have been diagnosed with lung cancer, if that's your 100% baseline, What's the percentage in these different countries of those lung cancer patients who smoked in the past? And we've got males in orange, females in blue. And you can see in the United States, it's still you know, upwards of 80% uh, on this, um, from this data set that uh, are former smokers or current smokers. But in some countries, especially among women, which is the blue lines, those who are getting diagnosed with lung cancer are not. Uh, are not smokers. So the disease is changing right in front of our eyes. And the problem with screening or the challenge with screening for cancer is that you have to know who's at risk in order to design your screening program. You have to be able to say who should come in and get screened for this cancer. And so this was really the challenge with which uh, we set out with Regina's team and my team together to see can we use AI to accurately predict someone's future personalized uh, risk of lung cancer. You can't tell by asking a specific question like, did you smoke? Um, how could we tell? And using a tool like that, could we then personalize screening guidelines uh, for different people? High risk patients should get screened more often. Low risk patients, maybe not that often. And this is how we do other types of screening too, as we understand more about cancer. Cervical screening has morphed into checking for HPV virus. If someone's never been infected with HPV virus, they're at very low risk for getting cervical cancer. So checking that infection status is really part and parcel of doing cervical cancer screening these days. Colon cancer screening is risk adjusted too. If you have one colonoscopy and you have no polyps, you don't need another one for 10 years. If you have multiple polyps or especially adenomatous polyps, you need another one in three or five years. So we have to do personalized screening. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna let Regina tell you about the model that we built together, uh, but uh, uh, let me just show you before you understand the full, the full details of the model, what it could do for patients. So this is a real patient. This is a CAT scan from a 69 year old man 
who had a heavy smoking history. And this scan was read by a human radiologist as negative. This, they didn't see anything that was worrisome. This is just one of the lungs. And the circle that I put on here is actually circling a normal area of lung, which because in retrospect, you'll see that something develops in that area. Even when we know exactly where to look in retrospect, the radiologist doesn't see anything amiss in that area. But Sybil, the model, the AI machine learning model that we built said, hey, this scan is high risk. This patient's in the 75th percentile of risk actually. And when this gentleman came back for their next scan, there was a mass there, uh, which is what the arrow points at. And it had sort of appeared out of nowhere. Um, Luckily, it was still an early stage cancer. He was able to have surgery uh, with a, a good chance of cure from that surgery. But what we know in the real world, this gentleman was actually enrolled in a clinical trial of annual screening. What we know in the real world is that the vast majority of people who go for one lung cancer screening do not come back for their next one. 75% of people do not come back if they come once. So he came back because he was in a clinical trial and it was very regimented but uh, that doesn't always happen in the real world. So Sybil, when uh, the model was applied, so this is the same gentleman, and now we're looking at both of his lungs. The baseline is on your left and the follow-up scan is on the right. The cancer is there uh, that you saw on the other screen, uh, the other slide. And uh, not only did the model tell us that this guy's in the 75th percentile of risk, but it actually showed us in this case why. They said there's something in this area, the area here that's highlighted with red shows Sybil's attention focusing on this area. Um, and that is the exact area where the cancer showed up on the next scan. So this is, we believe, an amazing technology that has the potential to really turn upside down how we're doing lung cancer. We've got nowhere to go but up. We're doing a horrible job of lung cancer screening. Uh, for this guy, it was actually two years between these two images. Um, but the interval one year scan looked exactly like the one on the left. Um, so it came up within a year. Um, uh, so, you know, we're currently, we're not screening the guideline recommended population, which is smokers. And the guidelines don't cover people who are getting the disease, which is everyone with lungs. So uh, we have nowhere to go but up and we're hoping that Sybil can really help us. So let me turn it over to Regina to tell you more about Sybil. Hey, so uh, I'm Regina Barzelai, and I am a professor of electrical engineering and computer science. And I am really grateful, grateful for the bridge uh, project that brought Lisa and me together. We met some time ago at a conference, and then we start talking about the possibility of working on this topic. And since we didn't have any preliminary results, we couldn't apply to federal grants. So Bridge really helped us to start uh, this um, amazing journey. And we both are really committed to ensure that whatever we are developing in our labs will be translated to patient care. And um, one thing that I just want to say to follow up Lisha's presentation before we go to the method is that right now Lisha is working and that's what is the topic of our current bridge grant on clinical prospective clinical trials so that we can really see how it changes the outcome for patients and this year looks at a very diverse population so I hope you would ask for more to tell you during the Q&A session but let me tell you a bit more how Sybil works so as you've seen in the example that Lisha just showed you that patient 
that even if somebody shows you where the cancer is going to be in two years, radiologists cannot really see. So the question is, how can you teach the model to do it if human cannot do it? So, and what we already know from many different tasks in computer vision, that if you provide the machine with a lot of images and you know the label, you know the outcome, machines are able to learn this correspondence between the image features, very subtle image features and the outcome. So in this particular case, we're actually very lucky. We had data from a very large trial um, which combined, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients from 33 hospitals in the United States. And pretty much what we had for every image, we knew whether for every image, we knew whether the patient developed cancer in one, two, three years, up to six years, or they never developed cancer. So, and given this data, we don't need to tell the machine, you know, what is the exact feature. It lands this feature on its own. And what's special about CWELL is that not only it can immediately read out after the patient did the scan, you don't need to do anything special, it can be part of the routine exam, uh, and it gives you both multi-year certification, tell you the likelihood for each one up to six years, but it's particularly accurate in the area of the first two years, you will see the numbers. And also what um, we discover both on lung and breast <laughs> that patients and their physicians are not really good in reporting uh, their own information. So I discovered when we were looking at the data for breast, for women who reported their clinical, you know, their demographic information when they went for their routine scans, um, you know, the number of their children changed from year to year in a way which was really funny. Uh, so, and many other things. The same thing, we know that people don't really report how much did they smoke and other things. So it's very dangerous to build models that rely on this self-reported information. So what we've done, we, our model only looks at the image. It doesn't ask any question. It only takes the image. And it's particularly important for places, maybe not like MGH where, you know, the data is not collected. Um, and it can be very easily used. And we had to ensure that the model works to do a lot of kind of interesting computer science. Uh, for instance, you know, we need to make this model robust to change in the slice size. Apparently different machines differently slice, uh, you know, slice the lungs. Uh, we also wanted to teach machines that if eventually patient did get cancer, how do you project it back kind of give to it attention? So we spent a lot of time doing computer science and it was really important because remember, if you teach the machine to identify cancer, this is a task that radiologists should be able to do. Radiologists is not able to predict future risk. So if we are to put this model into clinic, you can, you can only rely on the machine because radiologists cannot help to understand how good it works. So it's really important to ensure that it works. So the first thing that we've done, we actually looked at the performance of this model using this you know, unseen data from this uh, um, clinical uh, trial. Why nothing is moving? Like it's moving on my machine. Wow, wow. I was showing you all the slides, but nobody saw them. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is the example that I really wanted to show you. Uh, this is the numbers, and this is something that is used to evaluate the accuracy. It's called area under the curve. If the model is perfect, it's one. If the model is random, it's 0 0.5. So you can see even within the first two years, the performance is very, very high. And even if you're looking at the six years, it still remains very high. We also compared it against another model that only looks at clinical features, which is currently used already in clinics. And you can see that the SIBO significantly outperforms this model. Now, as you all know, that um, there is significant difference in population. People demonstrated the looking at your image. We can predict race, we can predict a lot of things. So we wanted to ensure that it works well in different populations. So we actually went to Taiwan. Uh, and in Taiwan, it was particularly interesting because in the United States, it's only smokers that are screened, heavy smokers. Well, in Taiwan, actually the whole population is screened because of the prevalence of lung cancer. And we can again see here, uh, Taiwan here is in gray. The performance is remains very high. We also did a special cohort on MGH. The model didn't see MGH data during training. And again, performance remains very high. But before I finish my presentation, I want 
to talk about something that I hope we will discuss later in the panel. It's about the question that we always get from physicians and biologists. You know, your model is a black box. Why wouldn't you help me interpret? And there are a lot of studies that were done by actually people even at MIT that demonstrate that whenever you give cooked explanation, which human cannot really validate, it's like reading tea leaves. And here it's particularly clear that even if you show what the model was looking at, humans still cannot validate it. And what we are doing and working very actively at MIT is the models that can actually self-monitor themselves. The same way as your microwave or your car, if they are not working, there is a red light that flashes and say, don't use me. So instead of relying on human intuition when it's already not there, we're developing models that can really tell you at this point, do not trust, just use whatever you would typically use. And the final things that I wanted to say, one of my jobs at MIT, I am AI lead for Jamil Clinic. And uh, one of our missions is actually to take AI tools that we develop here and spread them in the hospitals around the world. So we have this hospital network paid by Wellcome Trust, where we bring a lot of tools to, you know, to developing countries primarily. And uh, we are now translating Siebel to several of these countries. And surprisingly enough, there is more interest in Siebel than in other tools, I guess, because it's a really a serious issue there. So I'm uh, really excited about this collaboration. I'm even more excited to see what we will hopefully develop uh, within this year it's to do the clinical trials of this AI translated to patients. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, we're going to move over to the second part of the program now where we're going to focus on, on some of our technologies around non-invasive early detection. So um, I'd like to welcome Jesse and Ava to the second part of the discussion and then we'll move into a panel Q&A. Hello, everyone. So my name is Jesse Kirkpatrick. Um, I completed my PhD in Sangeeta Bhatia's lab here at the Koch Institute. Um, and I'm currently a, a postdoc, um, continuing my work with Sangeeta, um, as well as a medical student um, at Harvard. And I will um, let Ava introduce herself when I hand the mic over to her. So I'm really excited to continue this story about using machine learning to improve our ability to detect um, and manage lung cancer. We're gonna take it from a little bit of a different angle here though, by bringing molecular diagnostics into the mix. So this is a representation of kind of a tradition, a, a typical prototypical um, course of a patient's cancer. And I'm extremely grateful that Lisha went before me because she explained this much more eloquently than I ever could have. Um, but just to kind of reiterate the points that, that Lisha made, the cancer begins as this ball of cells that's not detectable clinically. And it's only when symptoms develop um, that patients come to clinical attention. Patients can then get treated, which hopefully results in a remission, but it, unless the patient is detected, the cancer is detected at an early enough stage for the um, treatment to be curative, pretty much inevitably um, the, the disease will recur, although there are some exceptions these days with the advent of immunotherapy. And so diagnostics have the potential to play a role at all of these stages. Alicia very nicely highlighted the role of early detection and detecting those tumors when they're still in that subclinical stage before they've actually caused symptoms. But if you don't manage to detect the disease early, then there are other diagnostic tools that, that can allow you to get a definitive diagnosis um, and perform risk stratification, which is where you can determine how well that patient is likely to do um, with therapy. Patients then get treated 
And then of course, it's really important to monitor them to assess whether their tumor has responded to therapy. And if it has responded, if and when it recurs, so you know at that moment, it's time to put that patient onto a second line or third line therapy. And so the goal of our work really is to think about developing a diagnostic strategy that could allow you to span this entire scope of the um, development and progression of cancer. Now, there are a lot of different diagnostic approaches out there, some of which um, Alicia and Regina have alluded to, um, but they all have limitations as we've discussed. So tissue biopsy, it's invasive, you have to know where to look. Imaging, we've talked about some of the issues with sensitivity, with with the requirement of a human to interpret an image. Um, there's also issues with di differentiating benign and malignant lesions, which, allow, which cause a lot of patients who have benign masses to have to undergo invasive and potentially um, life-threatening um, procedures. And then there are protein biomarkers circulating to tumor DNA. These are basically things that the tumor makes, they put into the blood and you detect with a blood draw. And largely the issue with these is that it's really difficult to detect these at a very, very early stage because the tumor is so small and the blood pool is so large that these things just get diluted to a point they're not detectable. So instead of relying on imaging, um, which we've talked about those limitations and these what we call endogenous biomarkers, which are biomarkers that are produced by the tumor and put into the bloodstream, We've thought about how can we actually use engineering to deliver something, think of it as like a molecular beacon, directly to the site of disease, and then read out what's going on in the tumor to the outside world. And so for this, we turn to a type of protein that's made by cancer cells, um, which is called proteases. And proteases are enzymes that function to cut proteins. And enzymes and proteases play multiple roles in cancer. They help cancer cells recruit blood vessels. They help them stave off um, immune cells. But I think the way that's, that's easiest to think about it is they use proteases to kind of cut up, to chew up the tissue surrounding the tumor, which allows them to spread, eventually invade into blood vessels and metastasize to different sites. So we like to represent proteases as little Pac-Men. And these Pac-Men chew up the tissue surrounding the tumor, allowing them to spread. So you can see, I can show that depicted here, where you have a Pac-Man, that, that little squiggle is, represents a short protein. Um, that protein can get cut by the enzyme, by the protease. Um, resulting in this irreversible cleavage. And so what we thought about, and this is a technology that was developed um, before we arrived at the lab, but that we've been adapting for um, lung cancer detection, is could we deliver something that looks kind of like this to the tumor and have this, this cleavage event, this cutting event, read out something to the outside world that tells us that these proteases are active. And so we, turn to a technology that our lab had developed and that we adapted um, that we call activity-based or protease nanosensors. And so this is depicted here. And we tested them in mouse models of lung cancer. So we could, when, you admin, when we administer these nanosensors into the lungs of mice, here's what happens. So the nanoparticles consist of a core, so a five nanometer polymer core. It's kind of like a tiny piece of plastic that is coated with what we call protease substrates. Those are kind of like those tiny little proteins that can be designed to be cut by proteases that are made by cancer cells. And then there's also this barcode, and that's kind of like that beacon that I was telling you about. So when the protease cuts the protease substrate, that, that little protein, that barcode can get chopped off, and then the kidneys are able to clear it into the urine. We can then do a urine test um, using standard methods, and then use machine learning to try to understand, does this mouse have cancer? And what's really cool about this approach is that we can combine multiple different combinations of protease substrates and barcodes, and then detect them uniquely in the urine. 
So in, these, in this work, we used 14 different protease substrates, which were designed to detect a set of, a, a set of 14 different um, sets of proteases, which were all expected to be um, overexpressed in lung cancer. So I'm gonna show two quick vignettes. One is related to early detection. The other one is gonna be related to treatment response monitoring. So for this first piece, we used a mouse model of lung cancer that was developed here um, at the JAX lab here in the Koch Institute, which is called the KP mouse model because it has mutations in KRAS and P53, which are two very clinically relevant mutations that are present in many, um, in many tumors in patients with lung cancer. And you can see that these tumors uh, recapitulate the uh, histological pattern of human lung cancer and they develop over the course of 18 weeks. And so what we did was we took our panel of 14 of these nanoparticles and we administered them into these lung cancer bearing mice or healthy controls, collected their urine, and we did this three times during tumor development. And so I'm gonna display this data in the form of what we call a volcano plot. You'll see why it's called a volcano in a moment. And these plots show the relative signal between lung cancer and healthy control mice on the x-axis and then the significance of those differences on the y-axis. So basically what this means is that any of the sensors that were increased in lung cancer are gonna be here. Anything that's decreased will be here. And anything that's not changed between lung cancer and healthy is gonna be down here. And so what we found was that at the very early stages, five weeks, when you look at all 14 of those nanoparticle sensors, you don't actually see any differences. The tumors are just too small. But as early as seven and a half weeks after tumor induction, when these tumors are only on the order of one to two millimeters based on quantification of CT images, we see that the volcano does indeed erupt. So there are multiple sensors that we see are increased in the lung cancer bearing mice. Um, and actually one sensor that seems to be decreased um, in those mice. And then at 10 and a half weeks, we actually see that those differences become exaggerated. So there are clearly differences in the protease profile in the lungs of the mice with lung cancer and the healthy control mice. And so um, in a moment, after I talk about the second vignette, I was gonna come back and talk about how we converted this data into an actual early detection tool. So moving on to the second vignette about treatment response monitoring. So for this piece of the, um, the project, we turn to a different mouse model of lung cancer, this one with mutations in the ALK gene. Um, ALK is a, um, a protein that is, or is a gene that is often um, mutated in patients with lung cancer. And what's really interesting about this type of lung cancer is that there is a highly effective targeted therapy for, it specifically goes after that mutant ALK protein. These, these lung cancers are kind of addicted to that, um, the signaling from that mutant protein. So when you inhibit that protein, you can cause the lung cancer cells to self-destruct. And so electinib is the, um, is the gold standard ALK inhibitor that's used for patients with ALK mutant lung cancer. And so we, uh, we used a mouse model um, that has mutations in the ALK gene. And you can see that these mice also develop tumors over the course of about 12 weeks. And what we did was we treated these mice with um, either with either electinib, which is the ALK inhibitor, or just a vehicle, which is kind of like nothing. Um, so treated versus untreated. And we, we um, treated them with our nanoparticles, ABN sensor, activity-based nanosensors. These are those protease sensing nanoparticles. We treated, we tested them multiple times over the course of treatment. So first of all, I wanna show you that indeed electinib does work in this mouse model. So the mice that are not treated, you can see that the tumor burden becomes quite large. Um, whereas the mice that are treated with electinib, the tumors dramatically shrink. And this is just three days after tumor induction, or sorry, after treatment initiation. And so, I'm gonna show you the result, first of all, of one of the nanoparticles in these mice that were either treated or untreated. So PPO1 is just one of those nanoparticle sensing um, proteases. So anything that's above this dotted line is increased in lung cancer compared to the healthy control mice. 
So you can see that as early as three and a half weeks after tumor induction, we already see an increase in PPO1, this nanoparticle, in the lung cancer-bearing mice. And those, those, um, in, those differences actually increase um, to, when you go to five weeks. But then as soon as we treated these mice with electinib, we saw a dramatic decrease in the signal from this nanoparticle. Um, in fact, this was just on three days after initiation of therapy. In contrast, the mice that were treated with vehicle, so not treated with the drug, their tumor burden continued to increase. And correspondingly, the signal from this nanoparticle continued to increase. And so this is just one of those 14 nanoparticles that we were testing. But what's um, again, really cool about this technology is that you can simultaneously test 14, oh, you can simultaneously test 14 different sensors and potentially even more. And you can see that they have all these different patterns. Some of them seem to go down after treatment. Some of them interestingly kind of seem to go up after treatment. And so this is kind of an overwhelming amount of data for, for example, a clinician to look at and say, okay, well, is this patient actually responding to therapy? Some things are going up, some things are going down. What's going on here? And so I'm gonna turn it over to Ava, who's gonna be able to talk about how we take these large data sets, all this data, and convert it into a tool that can actually be used uh, clinically. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, so thank you, Jesse. My name is Ava, and I'm currently a senior researcher at Microsoft developing AI and machine learning methods for a whole range of questions in biology and medicine. But prior to that, I did my training right here in the Koch Institute. And I think what is so powerful about this place, as we've already heard from Jesse, Regina, and Misha, is its ability to draw people together from different disciplines, engineers, computer scientists, biologists, clinicians, to work towards these common problems like the early detection and monitoring of lung cancer. So Jesse painted the picture very, very nicely here that we have these sensors that are so small, they're operating at the scale of biology. But we're able to generate data from them, but how do we actually turn this into a decision that can be used as a detection and monitoring tool uh, for, for the clinic or for doctors to interpret? And this is really the, the crux of the problem in that here with these sensors, because we're operating at the scale of the very, very small, we're able to directly interface and measure biology in this dynamic and personalized way and generate these rich data sets by which we can now think about how we can drive diagnostic decision making. And so from this perspective, we reason and ask, can we use the data that we generate from these sensors to build computer programs and algorithms that can look at these measurements and pick out what are patterns in these changes of the activity of these proteases that could indicate the presence of disease that could indicate a response to treatment, that could indicate a healthy state. And this is exactly what we did. We took those measurements that we read out, those beacons from those sensors, and now developed machine learning AI models that can look at these data sets and learn to recognize patterns in the data that indicate the presence of lung cancer or not. And this then is used to drive a interpretable decision, which effectively comes out to us as a likelihood, a probability, a score that tells you, okay, with 95% certainty, this uh, mouse in our case has a state that is indicative of lung cancer or it's a healthy state. And so this is the overall framework that we set up and established. And our task was next to deploy this in those two stories that uh, Jesse mentioned first in the context of early detection, and second in the context of monitoring response to therapy. So I'm going to show you next how well our method did at both of those, those tasks. First, thinking about the problem of early detection. And so here we're looking again at this framework where we're taking the data from our sensors, we're taking our machine learning algorithm, and our prediction that we're trying to generate out is how likely is it that this data indicates the presence of cancer? And when we test this in our mouse model of, 
of cancer, of lung cancer, we, uh, we can measure how well the diagnostic performs according to two metrics. How sensitive it is, meaning can we pick up on very small things when they're there? And how specific is it? Meaning can we d distinguish what is truly cancer from something that may not be cancer? And as Regina mentioned, we have this score, this metric that we call the AUC or area under the curve. And it's exactly like the name describes. We measure on this axis of the sensitivity versus the specificity, what's the area under the, the curve where a perfect test is going to have a value of one. And when we see we can evaluate our method using this metric, we see that indeed across all these different time points that we test across this progression of the tumor development, we're able to achieve very high accuracies, very high area under the curve in doing this diagnostic decision of distinguishing lung cancer from the healthy state based on these measurements from our sensors. And so this is really encouraging, right? Because we're able to detect uh, cancer relative to a healthy state. But as Jesse and Misha pointed out, another question is how well can we distinguish cancer from something that may not be healthy, but may not be cancer? So for example, a benign mass in the lung or inflammation in the lung. And we are able to actually test this directly in the mouse models that we use, where we can basically induce a ton of infl inflammation in the lungs of these mice, perform our same workflow where we administer these sensors and generate data from them, and now build a model that asks, can we distinguish lung cancer from something that may be benign, not lung cancer? And here we see that, in fact, in two different mouse models of lung cancer, our test performs very, very well at effectively distinguishing and classifying what is lung cancer versus what is a benign but not entirely healthy state, so in this case, inflammation. So this tells us, right, we, that we have the workings of a pipeline that leverage these sensors that are generating these dynamic measurements of biology to actually inform a test that could help in early detection of lung cancer in this setting. The next question we ask, as, as Jesse very nicely laid out, is, okay, can we translate this system forward to now think about not only can we detect lung cancer, but can we distinguish a individual who may be responding effectively to treatment versus one that is not responding productively? And that's exactly the second question we address in now thinking about deploying our system for treatment response prediction, where now our output, our decision that our algorithm gives us is not, is there lung cancer or not, but rather is that cancer responding effectively to the therapy that's been administered? And we can test this as, as was laid out in these mouse systems where we can treat the mice with the exact same treatments that we can, are deployed clinically. And using the same framework, we find that as soon as three days following initiation of treatment, we can now with perfect, near perfect or perfect accuracy, effectively distinguish which individuals are responding productively to these treatments versus those that may be not. So together, what we've, what we've shown and uh, realized here is now a data-driven pipeline that goes from the measurements generated by these very, very small sensors through to building models that can learn from these measurements to now produce decisions at the outset with respect to both detection and monitoring. This is all well and good, right? And we've shown this in these mouse systems, but what could this mean for you and I and for the future of how we think about lung cancer screening and monitoring? I'd like you to imagine a little bit and kind of envision what that world could look like as we think about translating this technology to patients and to the clinic. You can imagine now our sensors, those very small sensors that can measure biology in your body can be formulated just as an inhaler, just like you would take for asthma or another condition, where now we can deliver these sensors 
in a completely inhalable fashion. They traffic into the body, they survey the lungs. They're effectively interfacing with activity of disease as it's occurring in real time, sensing biology at the scale that it occurs deep within the, deep within the deepest parts of our body. And because we've designed and engineered these sensors in a way that we can read out these beacons and signals that they produce, you can envision doing something as simple as an at-home urine test on, on a sample to now think about, okay, how can I couple the sensor that, I, that was just administered to a readout that can be deployed at home or at the point of care? You can think about a, a readout that's akin to a pregnancy test where you can see visually. And you can have a model that looks at that, maybe it's a, through a picture on your phone, and then produces a recommendation, a likelihood, a prediction that you can then look at in an online report or at the palm of your of your own hand immediately. It sounds like you know this could be a dream, but we're actually actively working on this, and this technology is being translated um, to moving forward to clinical trials and clinical testing in the context of cancer and monitoring and detection for other diseases as well. So with that, I'll leave you with that thought and that vision and conclude by thanking those that have contributed directly to our work, as well as the Koch Institute and all of the agencies that were very generous in supporting the work that Jesse and I, amongst others in our team have, have done over the years. Thank you. We're gonna take some uh, questions. Um, I, I, I was gonna say, I know we're gonna get a question before we even sit down, so I don't even have to start the conversation. So I'm gonna grab a mic for you. Answers and later between responding and non -respond, uh, responding to the team. Can you say something about the size of the training set you used and about the classifier itself? Yes, yes. So the question was about some more details into how we set up this problem. What is the size of the examples that we see and what is the nature of the classifier? So in our case, right, we are doing these experiments in. Um, mouse models of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And so we extended our cohort sizes to on the order of hundreds of mice. And now we can make measurements at multiple time points. And so let's say you have a set of 100 mice and you are monitoring them maybe five times across or 10 times across uh, the course of tumor progression and treatment. And so then you have 10 by 100 in terms of samples and time points. And we, in our case, in the experiments that we showed, we had 14 different sensors that were measuring per uh, individual. And so that is kind of the, the scale along the different axes of data that we're measuring in these contexts. Um, obviously, there are limitations and caveats with respect to the scalability of that in terms of what we can do experimentally. And as far as the model itself, the classifier itself, we evaluated a different types of classification algorithms to determine what performed best. Um, and specifically the one that we ended up um, deploying was a type of classifier known as a random forest, which is effectively thinking about classification as a decision tree and looking at the individual uh, measurements from these sensors along the decision tree and using that to produce a final one more Prediction. question, and when you got the uh, ROC curve or the AUC and <coughs> results, uh, what was the size of the test set relative to the size of the training set? Yes, yes. So this is this is these are common questions uh, in in computer science, which I'm excited to hear. So question is about how you split between the data that the model sees during what we call training, right, when it's learning, and the size that you evaluate on. 
so generally, I think in these experiments, we did between like a 60 40 split or a 75 25 split, depending. 75 for the three. Correct. Yes. 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 Correct. Yeah. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's in that range. Yeah. I'm going to head to the back. So I guess it's a, well, uh, well, it's a very uh, impressive predictive power of your imaging uh, so algorithm. Um, from my uh, limited experience about AI power ECG and uh, the real world problem we have to handle is the, uh, well, the signal noise ratio. Actually, it could be from hardware. This could also uh, well, from the uh, uh, well, systemic. Uh, uh, so the problem, so, uh, so I guess my question is from your, well, the clinical test, what is the um, criteria you have to set up, uh, well, set up to uh, filter out this signal variation? Because uh, in my experience, it, I mean, in most of the cases, uh, it, it really added one more layer of complication above the physician's, um, uh, well, quote unquote, in consensus. So, um, and, well, the picture can be really fast. Yes, it's a great question. Basically, if I understand the question, it's how does a clinician interpret the data that comes out of one of these models? And also, how does it, how do you keep over time from the signal to noise uh, staying in control? So maybe you can ask, answer the second one. That's exactly what we're trying to study right now. The, uh, the clinical action that should come from these prediction models, at least in terms of lung cancer screening with Sybil, um, uh, because, uh, you know, when we did our initial work, we were looking to see was the model accurate at predicting cancer or not. When you're using a model in real time, you have a patient in front of you, and you don't know what's going to happen to them in the future. So it's you know, you're, you're relying on that past accuracy of the model to tell you what to do now. And there could be different cut points that each have their own pros and cons. Um, if you're very conservative with your cut point, you might catch every cancer, but you also might be further testing a lot of people who don't have cancer. And so it's where do you make that decision in terms of your sensitivity and specificity to trigger the next action? Uh, so th those are the questions we're answering in the clinical trials that are ongoing. As far as signal to noise, yeah. yeah. I'm not exactly very sure that I fully understand the question, but let me try and you tell me if I answered it. So there are two places where there is a measure of signal to noise. The first one comes with the quality of annotation, meaning that you know you need to make sure that if we know whether the patient got or didn't get cancer, because if you're going to use your data. And let's say the patient didn't come for screening and you translate it into the fact that they didn't get cancer, you're introducing systematic bias into the model. So in this case, we were quite lucky that, you know, this big trial, which was funded by NCI, uh, it was very meticulous because the data was collected so we can really train on the correct data where the cancer was not what the doctor said, it was what was by, you know, there was a biopsy and follow up. So it was not based on the reading of radiologists. We've seen in multiple cases, now we work on prostate cancer and breast cancer and uh, lung cancer. Whenever you are training it on the judgment of radiologists is the best way to destroy the model. Uh, because they're inconsistent, you're really confusing the model. So you need to train the model on the true judgment. So this is the first point. Then the second point about the noise. There is, maybe that's what you were alluding to, this is the noise related to deployment. What we see across the board, that even if you look at the device which is produced by the same manufacturer, depending on how they configure it, um, it, the, the images look different. The machine can actually perfectly tell you from if you train it to tell from which device does it come. What it means that if you are not doing something smart algorithmically, that the machine would be confused by these differences. And if you train it, the machine calibrated one way, but test it another way, they didn't do anything to account for it. Most likely, it's not going to work. So we worked a lot. There is a whole you know, class of algorithms, invariant learning algorithms that can robustly deal with variation. And 
most of our computer science work was actually how to make them robust towards this kind of differences. And, you know, uh, for, you know, I hope we did a good job, but for the reason that, you know, there can be some other variations that we can never even expect. And for this reason, we're now working on this model that can detect when you're out of distribution, when it doesn't look like what you train on significantly and you should not be trusting it. And I just want to say one sentence more for, you know, I think it relates to all of us. I've learned two weeks ago statistics that I still cannot forget that relates about it relates to clinical deployment of AI. Because, you know, we're constantly hearing about this AI and kind of, I heard some people asking me why their clinician never uses AI, but the truth is that nobody's physician uses AI. Um, but there was an interesting statistic that came from my colleague from Stanford, James Zhu, who collected the um, paying bills from the, all the insurances. So from last year, you know, there was this new bill that insurances need to put, put you know, their uh, billing codes, correct? So they went to 500 tools that FDA approved its AI tools. Now, each one of them theoretically can have a billing code that you can see how much these tools are used. So from these 500 tools, only 10 had corresponding billing codes, only 10. And from these 10, you know, 90% went to two tools, one that does retinopathy, like diabetes based on retina, and another one in cardiology. So just two tools, and they are tiny, tiny, percentage of the whole, you know, spending. So the truth is that there are lots of great papers about AI uh, and lots of great papers that are proposing how to do screening, but there's really very, very little work on translation. And that's why I'm so fortunate, you know, to have Lisha who leads the center for, uh, you know, for cancer screening. And there's really a true commitment from MGH leadership and MGB leadership to find safe clinical protocols that despite all the possible dangers, still bring this technology to patients. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll wrap up. Thank you all for your amazing talks. So you have shown us a successful story of developing nanosensors utilizing protein activities. So can you comment on the future possibilities to develop nanosensors using RNA measurement, so as we can develop RNA medicine into a molecular diagnostics for cancer screening, cancer treatment, prognosis. Uh, can you explain it in terms of nanosensor development and the AI-based model development and the clinical applications, possibilities, and the bottlenecks in the future roadmap? Yes, so I can. Um, uh, so, I, so the question was, um, how do you take all of, so we, you know, how do we take all this, you know, this technology that we've begun developing, um, or that we've developed, which are these nanoparticles that can detect proteases, um, and we've shown in these preclinical models that they are effective in both early detection and treatment response <laughs> monitoring in mouse models of lung cancer. But the question is, what are the future possibilities of this technology? And how do you, I mean, maybe I'm going on a limb, but how do you really get this into the clinic and translate into patients? Um, so I would say, so I'm, so, I'm, so I'm continuing to work on this technology. Um, I think that there are a variety of ways that this technology could be um, improved upon and expanded upon. I think one way is by combining. So I think that one, I think that one, you know, limitation of the technology we presented is that the nanoparticles go into the into the animal, and then the product comes out of the urine, and so we don't actually get a sense of what's really going on inside the body and where it's happening. So one thing that one one follow up study that Ava and I worked on was to develop. Um, was to develop kind of a, a, a way to visualize where in the tissue the proteases are actually active. And so we developed a, a new type of probe that you could actually put onto uh, tissue slices on microscope slides, and you could actually visualize which cells are responsible for producing those proteases, um, what, pro what proteases they're producing, 
what the cell types are, where, they're, where they are in the tissue, how they're communicating with each other. Um, so I'd encourage you to read um, our Nature Communications paper from last year if you're interested in that. Another thing that, that I'm really interested in is, is imaging. Could we use these protease sensing nanoparticles not just to tell you whether or not cancer is there, but where in the body it is? Could you use, for instance, a nanoparticle that's labeled with some kind of fluorescent agent that could stick to the cancer cells Let's say you are, you're in a, in a patient who's undergoing a colonoscopy screening and those, can, those, those nanoparticles could actually stick to the cancer cells. And then when you're going in with a colonoscopy, you could actually visualize which cells are lighting up fluorescent. And that could tell you like, oh, maybe there's a really small tumor here that wouldn't be detectable by eye, but is detectable with these fluorescent probes, which are much more sensitive. Um, and then as far as translation, um, I think Ava kind of laid it, laid it out a bit which is, you know, you need to convert these nanoparticles into something that could be inhaled with a nebulizer, a dry powder inhaler, um, a meter dose inhaler, which are, you know, the, the standard methods for inhalation delivery. Um, and you'd have to test them in clinical trials. I'm going to draw the evening to a close. Please hang out. Please, um, please chat with our speakers. Um, but I want to thank you all for, for sharing this amazing story about how we're really thinking about early detection and this true power of bringing together these different disciplines to really tackle this problem. So thank you again. Thank you, everybody.